good afternoon, uh, actually good evening from Helsinki, Finland. It may be a good afternoon in America. I'm really grateful for European Association Urology, European School of Urology to, to give me the opportunity to, to present our work. Uh, the title of the article is Thromboprophylaxis in Patients Undergoing Urological Surgery. I'm Kahe Tikkinen, I'm a urologist and a clinical epidemiologist. Uh, I'm from the Department of Urology at Helsinki University Hospital. Our hospital, uh, actually our Department of Urology is actually rather big. Uh, last year, for instance, we, we saw more than 50,000 outpatient uh, clinic contacts. We performed more than 3,300 surgeries, for instance. We performed more than uh, 400 radical prostatectomies, 95% robotically. So um, I guess I'm giving this lecture because I chaired the EAU guideline on thromboprophylaxis in urological surgery. It was the first, and it still is the first, procedure-specific guidance in, in, uh, in urological surgery for thromboprophylaxis. I have no financial conflict of interest. Uh, my uh, intellectual conflict of interest include EAU guideline chairmanship, and then also I, I serve as a panel member for the ASH guideline panel on prevention of venous thromboembolism in surgical hospitalized patients. Uh, as you can imagine, this kind of guideline work is a team effort. I was fortunate to have a super team uh, representing different countries such as Italy, UK, Norway, Canada, Finland, US, and very multidisciplinary from, uh, from urology and urogynecology to, to hematology and internal medicine and, and guideline methodology. Uh, we were funded uh, by the EAU and also by the Academy of Finland and, and uh, some other non-for-profit organizations such as Secret Eusebius Foundation. Okay, so uh, let's go to the, the uh, lecture. So first of all, uh, you very well know that, that, uh, that one of the complications which we want to avoid in surgery, uh, the, uh, those are DVT, deep vein thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism, PE. Together, we refer to these as VTE. However, there's the other side of the coin, which is the major bleeding. We know from some studies, there are not too many studies, but we know that there, there's probably substantial practice variation in the use of thromboprophylaxis both uh, within countries, but also between countries, and even uh, um, within uh, departments, and uh, even uh, within one person can prescribe very variably for similar kind of patients. One of the reasons for this uh, practice variation is the lack of procedure-specific guidance for urology and gynecology for these kind of patients. So, uh, so there was actually, this is not a surprise that there's a practice variation when there's no clear guidance. So uh, in this lecture, I'm going to give you, uh, go these four aspects. First of all, let's take a look on some of the principles, how to create an evidence-based thromboprophylaxis guideline, what you have to take into account. Then secondly, let, uh, let's use some time for thromboprophylaxis post-surgery. What actually did we recommend? Then I'm, I'm, I guess you are very interested, typically clinicians are interested in a perioperative management of antithrombotic agent, when to bridge and when not to bridge, when to do something else. And then in the end, after roughly 30 minutes of my talk or a little less, we will have about 15 minutes for your questions and, your, and answers. I try to do the answers as well as I can. So, so when we actually uh, want to give a recommendation, when we try to create a thromboprophylaxis guideline, whether to recommend or not recommend thromboprophylaxis, we, we should first of all, of course, you know whether we have effective treatment, in this case, effective prophylaxis. And these kind of situations in medicine uh, are, are best addressed by randomized trials. So what did we do? We performed first a systematic review and then a, a meta-analysis of randomized trials. Uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, for instance, in this picture, you see this is an eff effect of thromboprophylaxis. Here are trials which compared heparin to no prophylaxis. Here are two outcomes above these two um, first plots, non-fatal pulmonary emboli, which is we, uh, which is one form of venous thromboembolism, and then another other forest plot which has non-fatal bleeding. As you can see, there are a lot of trials, and they are rather old, but they, they're quite many. And now you can see 
uh, the pooled estimates. First of all, on, on, the, on the top, uh, there's the non-fatal pulmonary embolism. First of all, you see that there's about 13,000 people randomized in these studies. And, and in, the, in the heparin group, there was 50-something, and in and, and the control group, a little bit more than 100 events. And when we pool all these, we get the relative risk, reduction, uh, relative risk of 0.46, which is more or less the same when you round it. If you use heparin, you decrease the risk of pulmonary emboli by 50%, and that's what we assumed. Uh, the effect of uh, using heparin decreases the risk of venous thromboembolism by 50%. However, as said, there's the other side of the coin. In these trials, there was, uh, we, uh, there was about 12,000 patients included in trials. These trials, by the way, they are from uh, general surgery, abdominal surgery, gynecology, and urology. We thought they are direct enough for urology. We did not think uh, neurosurgical trials or orthopedic trials are direct enough and did not include them in our pooled analysis. So, so when we actually pooled these analyses, uh, of these about 12,000 patients, we found out about uh, 370 uh, with heparin got a major bleed, and then a r little bit more than 200 without. Uh, so in a control group, uh, got a got a major bleed, and uh, the pooled estimated relative risk was 1.48. That means when you use heparin, you increase the risk of major bleeding in your patients by about 50 percent. So this is a trade-off, clearly. So that's the first step. Now we know we have something, we know roughly what they do, but we don't yet know, do we need them? So uh, if we wanna know whether we actually need these drugs, we have to know the baseline risk. Uh, typically these randomized trials, first of all, they were old, and secondly, they exclude a lot of patients. They are not representative uh, uh, of the baseline risk of the patients, what we, what we uh, actually treat. And they are okay, uh, and they're actually very good to establish the relative effects, but they are not okay, the randomized trials, for the baseline risk. So what did we do? We did a series of systematic reviews to establish the best contemporary observational evidence. And if possible, we only used the low-risk of bias studies. If we, did, if we did not have any low-risk of bias studies, we used all studies. And then... We, we use the median value identified through this exercise and those median values we created um, separately for each procedure. So this way we were able to establish the baseline risk of different uh, risks for different procedures. So this is called ROTBUS. This was published last year online and in paper this year in European Urology two articles, ROTBUS cancer and ROTBUS non-cancer. Yeah, they are open access and you can get them through our website, clueworkinggroup.com. So what did these robust papers show? First of all, uh, there was a cancer paper which uh, established, the, uh, which had a 14 different types of urological cancer procedures and baseline risk of thrombosis and baseline risk of bleeding for these procedures. And similarly, there was a robust non-cancer paper which had 11 different urological procedures. So there's a roughly 25 procedures. I have to admit that much of the evidence uh, was low quality. Only for some procedures, which I will show a little later, we had high quality evidence for the baseline risk. What else did we find during the Rockbus project? We actually found out uh, uh, the risk of uh, thrombosis and bleeding and how it, uh, uh, in relationship with timing. This is a very interesting figure. Uh, in the y-axis, you see the proportion of cumulative risk of something during the next four weeks. So th that's why they uh, cross here at 100%. And then uh, the x-axis is the uh, time, the post-operative weeks, so the weeks after, uh, after surgery. So if we first take a look on the blue line, which is VTE, uh, you can see that the risk and timing of VTE, VTE is actually it's very standard. So this is this is this is a linear thing. So it plateaus immediately after the four weeks and the six weeks. It actually plateaus, but the first four week it's it's linear. So very differently though, bleeding as you know we know very well that most of the major bleeds happen immediately after surgery. The half of them happen during the first day, as you can see from the figure. 
and as many as 90% happen before day three and four. So only about 10% of the uh, bleeds happen during the rest of the month. So, so, so this has some implications. First of all, um, there's th this evidence, which was uh, established from the, um, three very large high quality studies, shows that if you use thromboprophylaxis, you probably should use it extended always. So th this, this, is, this, is, this suggests that uh, short-term prophylaxis probably is not enough. Actually, it may be harmful because short-term prophylaxis only increases the, the risk of bleeding when, uh, without really taking care of the, uh, the risk of thrombosis. So that's why our, our, our guidance is that if you use thromboprophylaxis, use extended. And then another thing, uh, our guidance is do not rush. So probably you should um, uh, not rush with the thromboprophylaxis. I know very well in many institutions typically are given six to eight hours post-surgery, but we recommend uh, the next morning after surgery. To be, uh, to be honest, there's no direct comparisons. There's no trials which compare something like pre versus post or early versus delayed uh, of the same agent. Those trials do not exist in, in, in uh, urological or abdominal surgery. However, all the new, uh, or not all, but some of the new direct oral anticoagulant trials, DOAC trials, or may, some may say NOAC trials, um, and they, they actually um, began uh, next morning. So, so they also suggest that uh, you, can, you can begin later. So here are the major uh, main results of the uh, Rotfast project, and and it, 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 there are some some of the results uh, uh, summarized in this table. Uh, as you see, there's a big variation in the risk of symptomatic VT between the procedures. You have been told maybe that pelvic cancer surgery are always high risk, but some of them are much higher than others. So some of them are actually not very high. For uh, if if we first look on the radical cystectomy. Uh, uh, there's a low, medium, high re patient risk strata, which I will show you a little bit uh, later. But you see that the, for the low risk patients, low patient risk patients, the risk is 3% and high it's 12. Uh, so it's something between 3 and 12%. We'll, we'll get a symptomatic, uh, uh, symptomatic VTE after cystectomy if not using any, any thromboprophylaxis. Uh, very similar estimates uh, after a robotic prostatectomy. However, we were not as certain. I will come later back to that. In robotic, uh, uh, sorry, in, in radical prostatectomy, there was substantial difference between the robotic and open approach. So we, we found a substantially uh, smaller uh, estimates in risk of thrombosis uh, in, in, in robotic approach compared to the open. There was a, a and, and then other, other kinds of surgeries, such as um, many non-cancer surgeries, uh, the risks were substantially lower. Uh, in terms of bleeding, there was less variation, but also in bleeding, there was a variation. For instance, some of the kidney procedures had a clearly higher risk than this, what you see in here. You can get all these numbers from the Rothbus papers or from our guideline. So after knowing the treatment effect and the baseline risk, um, uh, clearly, patients uh, differ. So, so you need to know some patient-related risk factors or, or potential protective factors. Again, ide ideally, you would find them through systematic review. We know that there are Caprini scores and Rogers scores, but they are super time-consuming and they are not really feasible in clinical practice and they are not used. So, so what we wanted to create, we wanted to create something what surgeon actually would use. So we wanted to create a very simple, surgeon-friendly model for VT and bleeding. We did not find a consistent evidence for bleeding, so we actually created it only for VTE. These all factors are very well established in the literature. They are age, obesity, and history of uh, VT, either yourself or in your family. So, so, so. Patients who did, didn't have any of these factors were considered low risk. And then um, with this uh, age 75, BMI more than 35, or having uh, VT in a family, uh, double CR risk or prior VT or combination of, of uh, any of those earlier mentioned uh, also uh, establishes yourself as a high VT risk. On top of these, there are some thrombophilias and other, uh, other 
diseases, which you will find from the guideline, which obviously are, are a little bit different story. These are the people who don't have a hematological uh, disease. So uh, when you know all these three factors, they are not yet enough. You also have to know how certain you can be on your estimates, so what actually is the quality of evidence, and then you have to think about the relative value of different outcomes. In this case, good outcomes is the prevention of VT and bad outcomes increase in bleeding. So when we actually, we use the great approach, and when you use a great approach, uh, you give either a weak or strong recommendation. Uh, you give a strong recommendations when benefits clearly outweigh the risks, hassle, and costs. Or if these harms clearly outweigh benefits, then you also give a strong recommend. In that case, you give against. However, quite often we are not able to give a strong recommendation, and there are two major reasons for that. First of all, uh, there's no high quality evidence. So we are actually uncertain in our estimates, even though there maybe looks like there's a clear benefit, but we are uncertain. So we are, then we are going to give a weak recommendation. And, or if, even if there's high quality evidence, but there's a super close balance, we are not sure of, uh, we have, there's a close balance between the harms and benefits. So in that situation, we also give a weak recommendation because it's not that clear what to do. We, we uh, considered in our work DVT and P equally problematic. We, we call them as a, any symptomatic VTE. We defined major bleeding as th this was a tough outcome. We only included if it was a bleeding requiring reoperation or re-exploration, including any embolization. So these are really, uh, we did not consider in this outcome transfusion or change in hemoglobin levels, for instance. So uh, because of this having like a rather uh, heavy major bleeding definition, we assigned twice the weight for major bleeding as for any symptomatic VT when doing the net benefit calculation. So we indeed did the net benefit calculation because we wanted to know whether we cause more benefit or more harm when we recommend thromboprophylaxis. And we decided based on some evidence that uh, that if more than 10 if there's a net benefit of more than 10 per thousand we will give a strong in favor so this means that if patient has a two percent baseline risk of thrombosis there's no risk of bleeds we will recommend um uh, thromboprophylaxis and we will give a strong if we have high quality evidence and high certainty on the contrary if, if if there's a very small super small less than one in a thousand or, or even harmful effect of thromboprophylaxis, which gave a strong against. And then in between these uh, two extremes, we gave weak in favor or weak against. These recommendations are only, uh, and remember, we can only give a strong recommendation if we have moderate high quality evidence. So quite often we had to give a weak recommendation. So now I'm giving you a couple of examples of our, our work. So, so first of all, there was 23 recommendations on pharmacological thromboprophylaxis. And about half of them had, had at least partly something uh, strong, uh, partly strong recommendation. We always gave recommendation for the low patient risk strata, medium, and high. So there's actually 69 recommendations in the end of the thromboprophylaxis. And you can find them all in the guidelines. So for instance, in radical cystectomy, there were, uh, we found that uh, we recommended, uh, this is a strong recommendation, use of pharmacological prophylaxis for all, even though the risks estimates were more or less similar for robotic approach. We, we gave only weak recommendation because the quality of evidence was clearly uh, worse for robotic uh, than it's for open radical uh, cystectomy at this stage in 2017. And we also gave a weak recommendation to, to use mechanical prophylaxis until ambulation for bo both these patient populations we never gave a strong recommendation because, uh, of the mechanical prophylaxis because there's no high quality uh, data available. Uh, another example, uh, radical prostatectomy without uh, lymph node dissection. Um, this is maybe contrary, uh, more interesting in a way. So, so for those at low risk of VT, we were sure there was strong recommendation against use of pharmacological prophylaxis. For those at medium and high risk patients, we suggest, so we gave a weak recommendation again against. However, 
we found clearly higher estimates for open approach. So and and but uh, so for the low risk patient, it was it was not that clear benefit. We gave only weak recommendation, but those with medium high patient risk strata, there was a clear uh, net benefit. So we gave a strong recommendation to use pharmacological prophylaxis after open radical prostatectomy without PLND. So then what about other lot and POP surgeries? These non, uh, so for instance, TURP, open prolapse, sling surgery for females, stress incontinence, vaginal prolapse surgery. So first of all, for all these, the baseline risk of thrombosis was so low that we suggest against use of pharmacological prophylaxis. Uh, the quality of evidence was not high for these procedures. Uh, we found that those who have uh, risk factors, uh, we suggest the use of mechanical prophylaxis, those who are at high risk, um, uh, if they are going to be not ambulating after the surgery. So this was uh, my talk about uh, thromboprophylaxis. Uh, then the rest of the talk, let's continue talking with the, the uh, management of anti-thrombog agents during the perioperative period. So first of all, there are four options, actually, what you can do with a patient and when you do surgery for a patient with, with use of uh, antithrombotic agents. So first of all, you can defer surgery until the uh, use of uh, these agents is not any more needed, and that's sometimes possible. Second, you can stop them uh, prior to surgery and restart sometime after. Uh, you can, obviously, you can also continue through the surgery. Or you can do so-called bridging, which has been popular during last years. You can bridge antithrombotic agents. Here are the agents, what we are talking about. You can find this uh, figure from the guidelines. And, to, uh, and, and then in the, par uh, in the brackets, you can find out uh, the, the, the time to stop if you decide to stop uh, so, uh, various uh, agents. Uh, Antiplatelet agents, most typically aspirin, Clopidocrel, um, typically you can stop them five days prior uh, surgery, whereas the um, optimal time to stop uh, and the coagulants rise are for in three to five days, and then the DOACs uh, need less time to wash out. So you have to remember that uh, all the earlier major guidelines have preceded some recent major studies. They're not necessarily anymore very recent. They were published during the last four years. But they are still not included uh, in, the, in the literature of the earlier guidelines which have been using. So these are the studies which, which are important to know. The first one is so-called POIS-2 trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, about uh, four years ago. It was a, a very large, rigorous, randomized trial. It randomized people to aspirin versus placebo, and it showed that aspirin increases uh, post-operative bleeding by 23%, but it didn't have, uh, have any effect on arterial thrombotic events or venous thrombotic events. So this is indirect evidence for other Antiplatelet agent and aspirin, but you have to remember we have no good data for the for them. So this is the best evidence what we have for them, and this is good evidence for very good evidence for aspirin. However, there was one subgroup analysis published last year in Annals of Internal Medicine from the same database, which showed that in those patients who had a prior PCI per ketinous coronary intervention, aspirin may be beneficial. So that's actually not said in the guideline because that was published immediately after the guideline was published. This is regarding the aspirin and antiplatelets, important new evidence. So then another very important trial published in New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago was so-called BRIDGE trial. The BRIDGE trial randomized thousands of patients to uh, bridging or placebo. And there was no these were, these were patients who were using uh, warfarin for atrial fibrillation and, and they were randomized then to bridging or, or a placebo. There was no difference in thrombosis, but there was double amount of bleeding when using bridging. So uh, our guideline group had two principles for perioperative management of antitrobic agents. First of all, the, uh, discontinue these drugs for the period around surgery 
or in those who have temporary very high risk of thrombosis, delay surgery until that risk decreases. If it's not possible to delay, then you continue those drugs or bridge. The, so these, these are our main principles. Let's go more to the details. So a couple of examples. First of all, we gave nine uh, recommendations. Seven of them are strong. You can find out them all in the EAU guidelines. So in patients receiving antiplatelet agents, we recommend stopping before surgery and not initiating any altered anti antithrombotic therapy. This is for the antiplatelets. So when you have stopped them before surgery, we, we recommend starting them when bleeding is no longer a serious risk, typically four days post-surgery. This may vary between the patients, obviously, but typically four days post-surgery rather than longer periods of withholding. So, so then patients who are very high risk of thrombosis, such as those who had a drug eluding stent placement within six months, those who had bare metal stent placement within six weeks, those who had a TI, TIA or stroke during last month, in those patients, we always recommend delaying surgery. Uh, if you can delay, um, uh, uh, then, then, uh, then you need to think about, obviously, you, you can always think about whether you can delay or not. Okay, so then uh, regarding um, anticoagulants, except those which I just told you who are very high risk, we, we recommend uh, stopping again before surgery and again not initiating any altered antithrombotic therapy. There are some patients who are, uh, who are exceptions. For instance, in a patient with a new venous thromboembolism, we recommend for, uh, always that you delay the surgery at least one month, if possible, uh, three months because then that way you can, we can permit discontinuation of anticoagulation preoperatively rather than operating with, with anticoagulation. So then another uh, special uh, patient group is those uh, who, are, who have a severe thrombophilia such as antithrombin deficiency or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. We suggest anticoagulation with either heparin or low molecular weight heparin through surgery. You can use bridging here. So same is, is the mechanical valves. Um, you can find all these in the guidelines. So in these patients, we, 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 we suggest anticoagulation rather than stopping. All these details you can find from, from the guideline. So my take home message, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in some procedures, thrombosis risk is high, bleeding is low, clearly, you should use prophylaxis. In some, we, we, the risk is low, bleeding is high. Clearly, you should not use any prophylaxis. That's not needed. It can be harmful. Unfortunately, though, most situations are not very clear because there may be a close call of benefits and harms or because we are not certain about the baseline risks. In these situation, situations, we gave weak recommendations, and, 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 and which means that you may do this way. Overall, in perioperative management, less bridging is needed. You can get the guideline from the EAU website, www.euroweb.org, and you can, we created an infographic which gives you guidance for every single procedure included in the guideline, and, and you can get it for free from our website, clueworkinggroup.com. I thank you very much for your attention. It's great that you are joining this uh, Euro webinar this evening, and and I'm more than happy to try to answer your questions. Okay, so uh, the first question here, whether to use a subcutaneous heparin or low, uh, which kind of heparin to use, low molar growth weight heparin fractured or whatever. Uh, actually, this is going to be also covered by the upcoming ASH guidelines. And, and, and so there's no, um, difference uh, between whether you use a fracture and unfracture and low molecular weight heparin or what. There's also uh, no trial showing big difference between different kind of um, low molecular weight heparin. So, so you can use whatever you have been using. We typically recommend using low molecular weight heparins because we have most experience, we have a lot of experience with them and they are uh, easier to administer. Then regarding direct oral anticoagulants, uh, the, it's, it's tricky to say anything yet. We, we have experience for them uh, for outside urology. The experience comes from 
internal medicine and then also from orthopedic surgery and and in future we, we i'm sure we will see trials comparing low molecular weight heparins to doax but at this point uh, we don't have a uh, direct evidence uh, in our guideline we we said that uh, these are options and and uh, you you may consider but to be uh, to be clear there's very little experience other than a low more uh, from the doax uh, in, in urology in actually in our institute we have been using for years uh, after uh, after radical uh, robotic prostatectomy and uh, they have worked uh, in our experience very well but it's not a randomized trial then there's um, a question regarding how often to give this uh, uh, prophylaxis. Uh, it's very interesting that, in, for instance, in some other areas of surgery, uh, we see that they typically use uh, twice daily, but we typically use uh, only once daily. Uh, and uh, that's our, uh, we again, couldn't find any high quality evidence for it. For comparison but typically what we use is, is one daily approach but to be uh, again clear there's not really compar clear comparison inside general surgery abnormal surgery or urology then there's a question uh, is there time between surgery time thrombosis is there necessary uh, is, is it necessary to give thromboprophylaxis in cases when surgery time is prolonged yeah i mean we know that uh, uh, that uh, the the longer the uh, the surgery, the more likely thrombosis. However, this is uh, mostly now taken into account in our approach. If you use our uh, procedure specific guidance, then it more or less takes into account issue of length of surgery, whether you should uh, give. Um, thromboprophylaxis for a procedure where you usually don't give, but uh, but but if your surgery gets way longer, it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, I would I would personally I follow our guidance, but of course you can al always uh, m sometimes do differently if you have a very good reason to believe your approach. Uh, then somebody asked here. Um, how to respond to weak recommendation. Uh, what do should I do when uh, my local guidelines differ from your EAU guideline? This is a, an excellent question. So first of all, there's two approaches. Uh, if you have a weak recommendation or strong recommendation, I, I would think you should uh, respond differently in this situation. First of all, if you have, if we give a weak recommendation, you don't need necessarily to change. You think about your context, and 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 the people you work with if if you think that there's going to be a lot of troubles and uh, and EAU guideline only gave a weak recommendation you have to think about do we have a better quality evidence do uh, do do we have a, some reason not to change according to the EAU guidelines and but the, so so in in that situation uh, but if if your if people in your institution are open for change then i would advocate for change also in the when we gave a weak recommendation and, and then also in the weak recommendations, you should also think about the patient more. So if the patient is more risk averse in terms of the thrombosis, then you're more likely to use heparin than other way around. But anyways, this was the weak recommendation. If you have a weak recommendation, of course, we suggest, we recommend that you follow our guidance, but that we also understand that there may be, a, it may be sometimes difficult to do the change very fast. So you may not want to begin with weak recommendations. What, what, what we really think more is that if, if we gave a strong recommendation, then you should read our recommendation. You should think about, do you agree with that? And, and why, why and, or if you don't, why you don't agree with our approach? Anyways, we, we think that if you agree with our approach and when we gave a strong recommendation, you should change practice. Even if your colleagues in your local institute say, no, 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 we have been doing differently. You can then say there's a high quality evidence um, published. There's a strong recommendation from the EU guidelines. We should follow this. So, so uh, I, would, I would advocate you to, to begin with the strong recommendations and follow them first if you don't want to do immediately the whole guideline. But I know many uh, uh, institutions have, are now following our guidance and they are very happy. So obviously it would be great if you would 
uh, follow our guidelines. So then uh, another question, uh, when do you think it would be the best uh, moment to start thromboprophylaxis after a major oncological surgery? Uh, so overall, uh, typically uh, we believe uh, our, our, our uh, evidence and, and that shows that the, uh, as many as half of the major bleeds happen immediately after surgery and because we are not necessarily that sure whether the bleeding is in control immediately after surgery, that's why we recommend not to rush. So, uh, so that's why our recommendation is, is that the next morning after surgery. However, if you think the patient is super high risk of thrombosis and you are very uncertain that there's no bleeding, you may begin earlier. Or if you think that this was uh, the, the bleeding control in your surgery was not that good enough, you may want to wait even longer than one day, one or two days, and, and see that you are stable. You use mechanical prophylaxis until that, and then uh, start uh, pharmacological prophylaxis later. So overall, uh, uh, we, uh, we always recommend starting obviously immediately with the, with the mechanical with the high-risk patients and, and, and then, uh, then a little bit later with pharmacological because of the bleeding risk. There's a, uh, we use a low weight heparin starting 12 hours before surgery since 10 years. I read the evidence is not strong about this practice. Best to do uh, start after surgery. Maybe it doesn't make any difference again. And please don't start immediately after surgery. We say that the next morning typically a good way to start, but you, uh, as I said, you may consider also different options. Who is responsible for adequate pre-op risk assessment? Is it the urologist or anesthesiologist? That's a good question. In many, many, many centers, uh, I, I would imagine it's an anesthesiologist. I think we should, uh, especially because anesthesiologists don't have a procedure specific guidance, we should not and I take forward this our guidance and our new evidence and and discuss this with our our anesthesiology colleagues that they would actually be aware of our new EAO guidelines and they would include them in their their work and then in the end if we use same guidance we would end up doing similar decisions for our patients so it would not make a difference who is doing the but uh, in a in a basic situation where there's a not very complicated patient, I think urologist can do the decision clearly without a problem. But obviously, when there's a more diseases, then we need our car cardiology, hematology, and anesthesiology colleagues more. And then the question is that uh, the last question here is that did the uh, can, if I understand this correctly, is that can mechanical prophylaxis replace the use of uh, Pharmacological prophylaxis, this is an excellent question, hard to answer. So uh, there's not really uh, trials which are comparing head-to-head -head mechanical and pharmacological. The, all the mechanical prophylaxis trials, they are very old, and also actually many of the pharmacological are. Um, we are more certain about the effect of, uh, of a pharmacological prophylaxis. There's way more, um, the quality of evidence is higher. So we can be more certain what actually pharmacological prophylaxis does. Regarding uh, mechanical prophylaxis in those trials, which are way higher risk of bias, the effect was actually more or less the same. So, so, so what we recommend is that uh, begin with mechanical if you think prophylaxis is needed and then and use it until ambulation and then uh, begin a pharmacological day after surgery and then uh, continue that with, with pharmacological prophylaxis four weeks uh, post-surgery if that's required. I think uh, we have come to the end of this uh, webinar this time. I thank you very much for your attention, your participation, and EAU for opportunity to give this lecture. And I wish you good evening or afternoon or whatever you have now.